What's up, guys? Welcome to Breaking the Set. Well, if you watch this show, you know how much of a fan I, have, I am of Nestle. I kid, I kid. Guys, there's finally a victory to declare against the massive bottled water corporation. And while it may still be a drop in the bucket, it's something to celebrate. See, after decades of wild west water extraction in Ontario, the company is finally being reined in, slightly. In this Canadian province, the Ministry of the Environment has granted Nestle a permit to extract 1.13 million litres of groundwater every day. But that access wasn't enough for Nestle. The corporation fought tooth and nail to remove a restriction that would, permit, that would limit their extraction during times of drought. Because, hey, why conserve water during a drought, am I right? As ridiculous as it sounds, the Ontario Ministry caved time and time again, never imposing the restrictions. It wasn't until activists stepped in and pressured their government that Nestle backed down and accepted the drought rule. Of course, now they're crying and complaining that they're the only corporation in the province who has any sort of limit during a dry season. Well, sorry. I can't shed a tear for you, Nestle. Because even though you can't turn Ontario into a desert, you can still turn British Columbia into a barren wasteland along with any other province you have your greedy, wet little fingers in. So quit with the crocodile tears and props to the activists who are standing up to the water profiteers. After a 20-year-long legal battle, a major trial has begun at a New York City federal court. It's called Chevron Corp versus Stephen Donziger, and it calls attention to an environmental disaster at an oil field in Ecuador that dates all the way back to 1964. The oil field in question was operated by Texaco, later bought out by Chevron. It was an area of pristine Amazon rainforest, three times the size of Manhattan, but has since been subject to the catastrophic effects of oil contamination. See, Texaco spent decades dumping an estimated 65 billion gallons of toxic waste directly into the ground. By 1995, Ecuador's national oil company Petro Ecuador had seized most of the land destroyed by Texaco and reached a settlement with the oil giant in which Texaco agreed to clean up a portion of the contaminated land. And since Chevron acquired Texaco in 2001, Chevron has said that its hands are clean, its obligations already fulfilled. But Chevron did nothing to address the damage done to entire communities directly impacted by contamination. And up until 2011, Chevron probably thought it had gotten away scot-free. Until an Ecuadorian court ruled in favor of the spill victims, awarding indigenous communities $18.5 billion to be paid by Chevron. But as underdeveloped exploitation and immunity for oil companies goes, Chevron wasn't going to let that slide. Yet, what should have been an unprecedented win against corporate impunity wasn't. Instead, it's become a long, drawn-out legal battle between one of the largest oil companies in the world and indigenous residents of the Amazon rainforest. These Ecuadorians continue to suffer from a slew of health effects, a direct result of living on this toxic land. Chevron, having no remaining presence in their country, has managed to avoid paying one cent of the $18.5 billion owed. Moreover, the oil giant is now accusing Stephen Dongziger, the attorney representing villagers in the case, of committing fraud by bribing justice officials in Ecuador to rule against Chevron. And just to add insult to environmental injury, Chevron recently subpoenaed the federal government for private data belonging to activists, lawyers, and journalists who criticized the company over the course of the trial. After all of this blatant criminality, Chevron still maintains that they are the victims here, victims of a mass extortion conspiracy. Yes, Chevron, the world is conspiring against you. It's amazing that the legal team representing the actual victims is now what's in question. Just yesterday, dozens of activists rallied outside the courthouse in New York where Chevron's extortion charge just kicked off. So how much is this latest trial setting back the real issue at hand? Justice for those who were poisoned. To help me break down the latest in this case, I'm joined by Han Shan, spokesperson for the Ecuadorian victims of Chevron contamination. Thanks so much for coming on, Han. Thanks for having me, Abby. So what's your response to Chevron saying, you know what, we bought out Texaco, it wasn't us who created the disaster? Well, quite simply, uh, you mentioned adding insult to injury. I think one of the most important points uh, about this whole case is that it's not just Steven Donziger on trial. Chevron has actually sued the victims of its contamination uh, in the most sort of egregious new form of blaming the victim. Chevron is suing uh, under RICO all of the 47 named plaintiffs who were part of the class action that originally 
took them to court for contamination, massive contamination throughout the Ecuadorian Amazon. So it's not just Stephen, it's not just their legal advocates here in the U.S. Uh, it's actually the Ecuadorian victims of Chevron's widespread pollution throughout the rainforest that are named in this suit and who are defending themselves in court this week. Uh, thanks for explaining that. Um, talk about this contamination. Talk about the actual scope of it because well, I really haven't been able to get a proper assessment. Certainly. Uh, to show that I'm fair, um, it should be noted that, that you mentioned, I think, in, in the setup that uh, they dumped some uh, 65 billion gallons of, of toxic wastewater. Now, we don't have evidence of that, and I think it's actually much lower. They've admitted, they've ad actually admitted um, in a newspaper ad, actually trying to clear up the facts in the matter, that they've dumped 16 billion. That's still a tremendous amount. That's polluting 24-7 for the 20, near 25 years that Texaco, now Chevron, operated in the region. Now, they dump this toxic wastewater directly into the streams and rivers and marshes. The, these streams and rivers in the area that are depended upon by thousands of people for drinking water, for bathing, for, for fishing in. Um, this was an area that was pristine when Texaco arrived in 1964 to, to begin oil operations. And now it is uh, a wasteland of environmental uh, disaster. It, you know, it was an environmental free fire zone, essentially, for several decades. And there are waste pits uh, that Chevron left behind that are open air, unlined, sludge filled, crude filled waste pits that leach into the groundwater and into the soil. Uh, there is, I mean, the water is poisoned everywhere so that the victims, the Ecuadorian villagers who live in that area, uh, suffer from an epidemic of oil-related illness, cancer, uh, birth defects, uh, miscarriages. Uh, it's, it's a horrific thing to behold, and I've been there myself uh, numerous times. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I wish anybody who, who uh, doesn't necessarily believe the facts in the, in the case to investigate uh, this, because really Chevron's allegations in this new RICO suit are really just the, the latest egregious uh, stage of its campaign and, to and evade let, accountability. And let's go back a little bit because I think the part that's most startling is the fact that Chevron actually lost this case and was ordered to pay um, for reparations and damages and then they basically were just able to completely avoid this at all. How did that happen? Well, Chevron has just thumbed its nose at the entire legal system in Ecuador and it's important to note that in 1993 this, this lawsuit uh, that they lost uh, was originally filed right here in New York in the same court where they're now litigating uh, this case against the e Ecuadorian victims of their pollution. Um, it was filed in 1993 because that's where the headquarters uh, in New York because that's where the headquarters of Texaco was at the time and, and it seemed like the appropriate forum to, to hear the case. Now, Chevron fought for 10 years and prevailed in their efforts to move the case to Ecuador. That was the forum that they chose. That was the forum that they said in numerous affidavits was the most fair, most uh, appropriate, most uh, transparent forum to hear the case. And in 2011, after eight years of litigation down in Ecuador that included uh, you know, some 220,000 pages of, of trial evidence, uh, in the case record eventually, um, they were found guilty. They were found liable of massive contamination, which everybody knew. Um, but uh, basically, they were expecting an adverse judgment. And expecting an adverse judgment, they launched this retaliatory RICO lawsuit, this campaign to evade accountability. And that's where we're at now. Amazing. So not only did they force the, the lawsuit out of the country, but then when they did, they used that kind of as a justification to say, hey, you guys bribed these officials. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, and not only have they not paid any money, they're now alleging that indigenous Ecuadorians and their lawyers committed fraud. What yeah. is the actual claim? I mean, what evidence do they have to back up these allegations? Well, basically, I, you know, I, I uh, was saying to, to somebody recently, I, I can't recall, but that they've really done a fantastic job of just the most amazing sort of political and media jujitsu, where they've taken all of the things that they've done over the course of this 20-year legal fight, corrupting the judicial process, bribing judges, uh, attempting to entrap witnesses, falsifying evidence, uh, and they've 
basically accused us of doing it. And um, what they have is uh, the tremendous power and might of one of the largest, most colossal uh, corporations that has ever existed in human history. Um, and they're putting it all behind this case. Um, they have thousands of, of uh, associates working on this from, from legal, uh, from lawyers to private investigators that they've hired to lobbyists to uh, PR flax. And, you know, they're throwing everything that they have at it because I think that they're nervous, not just about paying for uh, the disaster that they created and, and helping uh, the victims of, of uh, the company's pollution, but I think that they're concerned about the precedent that it could set for uh, holding companies like Chevron accountable for their abuses, whether at home or abroad. Thank you so much. We need to keep the pressure up, hold Chevron accountable for this mess. Absolutely incredible. The tactics of intimidation are just astounding. Thank you so much, Han Shan, spokesperson for Ecuadorian victims of Chevron contamination. Thank you. Although the modern music industry is notoriously vapid, there are a few diamonds in the rough that use art to advance social consciousness. One of those artists is Eleanor Goldfield. She's an L.A.-based singer, songwriter, and frontwoman of the band Rooftop Revolutionaries. Eleanor has also been a vocal supporter of Occupy Wall Street and Amend This, a movement to keep money out of politics. She joins me now from L.A. studio. Eleanor, welcome. Thank you for having me, Abby. So I hope the sh government shutdown sham has given you some uh, material to be inspired by. You know, we hear a lot about armchair revolutionaries, but what exactly is a rooftop revolutionary? <laughs> well, um... I used to live on a roof here in Los Angeles in the Silver Lake neighborhood. And Rooftop Revolutionaries started actually as a political group. And then I came up with the idea to combine my passion for political activism and my passion for music. So that's where Rooftop Revolutionaries was born. I like it. Uh, bridging art and activism, of course, we know can ostracize a lot of musicians from a lot of audiences. Why did you choose to relay politics in your art? Well, I think it's actually, I think it's the job of artists to be that voice of a generation. Um, as artists, musicians, painters, movie makers, etc., we have the strongest voice in popular culture. And unfortunately, the voice of so much of my current generation's popular culture is don't stop the party and things like that. And I think that there's such a much more important message to be put out there, um, most notably being the end of corporate rule and corporate power that is the biggest issue facing my generation worldwide. And I think that since we do have that strong voice, it's our job to take up that fight and to promote that to, to fans and to people all across lines, social lines, through music and through art. Right. I mean, music really does have that ability to bridge a lot of people together um, past just the kind of the political bantering back and forth and really galvanize people. Your band uses a lot of American flag imagery. I thought this was really interesting. Why did you choose to embrace nationalistic symbolism? Because I do think that the flag itself, um, just like this country, was founded on tremendously strong ideals and tremendously uh, powerful ideals that promote the idea of a, re a de democratic republic and promote the idea of power by the people. And I think because that is so strong, I'd like to put that back into the, the, uh, the spotlight as a positive symbol and not just a symbol of where we've gone wrong and um, the issues and the negative effects of that flag. I think it could be a, a, a strong symbol for good. And I'd also, of course, it is a very strong symbol, so um, pushing that out there also promotes the idea that the band is a political band and to not be afraid of being political because, like I said, it's very important these days to be politically active, and that flag is a very strong symbol of that. Well, that's what I, I like about it, because when you usually see that flag, it's a lot of super uber patriotic musicians and, and songs, and so I like how you're kind of using it but to say a, a very stark message and kind of a warning about where this country is going. I wanted to play a song for our audience, um, Complicity, off your album Resolute. Let's check it out.
neocons took up their arms in faith. Genocide wears suits and ties. Let's play. Very powerful lyrics. What does that song mean to you? Uh, basically, it's the, the idea that because we do live in a republic, a democratic republic, everything that this country does has our stamp of approval on it, whether or not we do approve of it. Our silence speaks louder than any words um, that we've so far put across. So complicity is basically the, that we're complicit in this crime. We're complicit in the crimes that the United States performs here and overseas. And that's what that, what that song is, is saying. And Eleanor, on your blog, you were saying that it was rare to find musicians or music industry professionals, especially in LA, who are intellectual or cultured. Why do you think that most aren't? Um, again, it goes back to the idea that um, popular culture these days seems more interested in not stopping the party. And um, as my guitarist Brian actually put it once, um, this generation seems really intent on preaching escapism and basically the idea that let's not pay attention to the bad things that are happening right now. Let's just pay attention to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And sure, that's fun, but again, there are more pressing issues. And um, it can also be an entertaining way of, of discussing these issues. And that's the idea of, of bringing it to a musical medium, is that you can have fun at a concert. I don't want people to come to our shows and be bored or depressed. Uh, music is a very entertaining way of putting forth this message. And when people are entertained, when they feel engaged, they're more intent on sticking with it. And that's the whole idea behind it. As to why people aren't more uh, politically active, I think there's a bad rap, basically, on being politically active. Um, and I see it all the time as well. I mean, a lot of the people that I've dealt with in Move to Amend or Money Out, Voters In, or even Occupy Wall Street, a lot of those people were much older than me. And so it is this problem that a lot of people in my generation and in the music industry, entertainment industry, feel that it's not cool or it's not sexy to be into right. these sociopolitical issues. Just tune out completely. And of course, the industry suppresses a lot of political activism with music and all the like. Thank you so much. Eleanor Goldfield, amazing to have you on. Activist, songwriter, everyone check it out. Thank you so much, Abby. living in an era of greenwashing. As people are becoming more environmentally conscious, corporate America is using the green movement to its advantage. Case in point, ethanol. What started as a concept to reduce dependence on foreign oil and support clean air initiatives turned into a Wall Street-backed crony industry with little to no oversight or regulation. See, eight years ago, the EPA mandated that oil refiners mix ethanol with gasoline. Or they had another choice, buy ethanol credits in the form of 38-digit renewable identification numbers, better known as RINs. Hang on. These credits are provided by the government to incentivize the expansion of the renewable fuel industry. Sounds great. Now there's a federal requirement on the amount of ethanol credits that you need. And if you don't have them, you can be fined up to $32,000 every day. But of course, Wall Street, being as corrupt as it is, seized upon this new market and transformed an environmental program into a profit machine by hoarding hundreds of millions, if not billions, of RINs to sell and trade. So how did this happen? And who's hurting as a result of this shady practice? Joining me now, host of the new RT show, Boom Bust, Erin A. What is Hello, up, darling. It's thank so you for good. coming thank on. Thank you for having me on. And, uh, I have to say, you sum that up better than most people could. This is uh, the front page of the New York Times about what I guess six weeks ago you now. You were telling me about this, Aaron, and it, just, and I was it just, blows my mind. It but blew my mind too. I had no idea that all this there. was going. So <laughs> how is it? And this is my question: How is it that banks are able to trade commodities? Because I thought back in the day. They weren't able to do You're that. You're absolutely right. Well, it, 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 they, no, they weren't. <laughs> banks were actually functioned as uh, they functioned as banks, and they were banked, if you will. It's uh, the repeal of Glass Steagall in 1999, basically let non let financial institutions participate and own non financial corporations like commodities operations, like ethanol, like aluminum, like other other commodities. Banks can own those, and if you own it, obviously talk about being an insider and. There's no need for insider trading when you are the insider. You literally own the company on which you're trading. So crazy. 
Why are banks even involved? Okay, I, I get that, and I, and I understand that banks are just, you know, they see the profit, the dollar signs are going crazy, but I just don't understand why the EPA allowed banks to be involved in a market that has nothing to do with energy or refining. I mean, you would think that the EPA would say, hey, the only people that can get these credits are the energy companies or the refiners. They, and that is exactly who can get the credits. However, while the EPA, they do issue these credits, it goes back to what you were saying before. This market is built for what Wall Street, they salivate for this. Poorly regulated, <laughs> not a lot of transparency. It's built for corruption, if you will. But it's not corrupt because it's not illegal because the EPA really doesn't have any oversight. The EPA created this in an effort, you know, for, like you said, renewable energies. But then when they created the market, they then said, oh, let's, let's let the free markets dictate it. You can't cre be the market creator and then spout about free markets. It doesn't work that way. You either have to come in with some sort of regulation. But basically, they allow the, the banks to get involved. It doesn't function like a regular commodity on a regular exchange. With an exchange, there's some level of transparency because there is an exchange. This has not. You and I could trade RINs, uh, the renewable energy, the renewable, uh, I can't even think of it right now. Renewable identification yeah, number, the 38 digit renewable identification number. You and I can trade RINs. It's done like the good old heyday of Wall Street, the, it's like 80s. the black market. <laughs> it, it, we literally could pick up and start trading, which yeah. is why the spreads on it are so much bigger than that that you'd see with a regular stock on a regular commodities exchange. So how you know, how is it that there's so little regulation, I guess, is the next question. I mean, how is it that the EPA has almost no transparency and that's regulation over you this? You know what? Uh, that's, that is the question of the hour, and, and a lot of people have been asking that. I hold the EPA to a higher standard than a lot of other, other agencies in the government, and the fact that they are just touting free market, oh, let the free markets dictate it. Basically, the EPA is saying, this is a great thing. This means that there's more renewable energies, RINs are going up, the price is going up, but what they never did, they didn't take the time to stop and think that it was in 2005 that this law that required you know, uh, energy companies to, to put this 38-digit RIN mm. on the bottom of each barrel that it says either you mixed ethanol in or you paid the price because you didn't mix it in. They didn't realize that when they made this law, the market wouldn't continue to grow. They thought the market would grow into 2022. It hasn't. 2008 came, Every there was a session. crash, and mm -hmm. the people started using more fuel efficient cars. Tesla, everyone loves now, and it's, I mean, that doesn't need gasoline. I don't at all. buy it, though. I don't buy that the EPA is saying, hey, we don't see anything shady going on. What's going on? You are um, preaching to the so choir. What, so, uh, so, what do they EPA, have to gain? what's going on? So yeah. What do they have to gain from, from doing this? I guess keeping this just completely like. Again, a that, they, I mean, they created a mini monster in the sense that they created this market that they weren't involved in. And it's really, really difficult, you know, to anticipate a market's actions and what a market's going to do when you don't know the market. And, and they yeah, can't... When you're, yeah, it when you're just there. creating it and you're not familiar with it and you're not familiar, it's, and then you leave it lo loosely regulated and say, hey, that's a good thing. That means people are buying these things that we say are better. Someone is out there to gain. You're absolutely right. It's a matter of finding who that person is. Is, is. is it the lobbyist for the ethanol markets? Is it, I mean, the ethanol markets, thumbs up A-OK. -okay. They're making tons of money because now they have a built-in market. The government requires everyone to have this, and it's, it, it's a trickle-down effect. Who will it affect ultimately? The consumer. It'll also affect the cars, the cars that we produce. You can only put so much corn in gasoline right. before the pumps start breaking. Yeah. So yeah, basically the the cost is going to be laid out on the people who are, um, you know, these banks are hoarding all these RINs. They're selling them for way costlier than they should be. And then of course the company is going to relay that price onto the consumer at the gas pump. Right. And here's the thing: we don't even know what that price is. Right. We know that in the first six months of this year, six billion dollars worth of RINs were issued. And excuse me, traded, traded. Six billion dollars in six months. How much do you think that is since it started, since it started in 2005? Really? <laughs> uh, I mean, but then we don't know. We don't, we don't know, know how much it is because there, there isn't any transparency. Um, the commodities, uh, the commodities uh, future, excuse me, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, they say that you can voluntarily participate and tell us how many RINs you have, JP Morgan, Citibank. <laughs> guess how many participate? So, take a guess. You, ding, ding, Zero. ding, ding, ding. <laughs> no one participates in this. So it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's kind of a scam and someone is out to profit and it, it's trickled down. Like, well, it, I'm glad this is becoming exposed because I had no idea. Um, what do we do, I guess? How can it. we scale this back? You want to know something? It's funny that you bring that up. Just the other day when I was getting ready to come in here to RT and uh, doing a little yoga with the television on, I saw a commercial 
saying, you know, stop the ethanol market manipulations, like you see for her. And I was like, whoa, this is getting out there, and that's a good thing. I well, mean, let's keep our eyes on the ball, Aaron. Um, we'll be checking out your show, Boom Bus, on RT. It should be awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, breaking this down. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. That's it today for our show. Have a great night. Be sure to tune in to Boom Bust. Everyone, check out the promo. True. False. Five. So. Always. Never. Loud. Quiet. Surplus. Deficit. Rich. Poor. Boom. Bust.